right, so uh, today's next presentation marks the first of many that are endorsed by the Our House Student and Staff Committee. Our House is a committee that focuses on diversity and inclusion as someone it hopes to promote better understanding of each other through their discussion and activity. The Our House Committee meets every other Wednesday at lunch, and we welcome anyone who has an interest in discussing issues of diversity and inclusion in our community. Our first on speaker series presenter is Mr. Wills. Let's listen to his story and see what we can take away from it. This is Our House, and these are our stories. Kentucky, where my father was the editor of the local newspaper. Because of his job, we received in our house the monthly newspaper of the FBI. When I was young, I used to pore over these magazines, which contained things like fingerprinting tips and mug shots of the ten most wanted criminals. Ironically, only a few years later, I had gone from wanting to be in the FBI to being wanted by the FBI. So fate can sometimes turn on dime, as you may know. I was not a rebel in school. I was an honor student. I was student council president, which is the equivalent of head prefect. My brother Robert and I did, however, launch a petition to the school board to allow married students to take part in extracurricular activities. So maybe we had a sort of activist bent, something we may have inherited from our father, who, was, who once described himself as a due process radical. But in the 1960s, the war in Vietnam was a touchstone issue. American society was as polarized then as it is now, and I was opposed to the war. My brother and I applied to the local draft board for conscientious objector status, which is an exemption for military service on moral or relig religious grounds, but we were turned down. In 1969, when I was 18 and in my second year of university, a friend visited Toronto to see a concert by John Lennon. And he came back with tales of how cool things were up in Canada. Soon after that, my brother and I departed the confines of academia for what might be called experiential education. We came up to Toronto and we loved it. And for the next year, we traveled back and forth across the border with only visitor status in Canada. Meanwhile, the American draft system had determined that my brother and I were likely to be called up for military service. But for some reason, we blithely ignored that. In retrospect, I would have to say that my downfall, and maybe my saving grace, was that I didn't take this whole thing very seriously. I naively thought that as long as I kept the right attitude, they couldn't touch me. An example of this kind of thinking came early in this, this process when my brother and I were called in for an interview by a sergeant in an American military office. So, your brothers, he said, are you married? Without thinking, I stole a joke from the Smothers Brothers, an irreverent left-wing comedy duo at the time. No, I said, we're just brothers. He looked at me as if he was going to tear this long-haired hippie in half. And he probably could have. Behind him, a, a typewriter, a private, was stifling a laugh. But suddenly it hit me that maybe I wasn't taking this whole thing seriously enough. 
The depth of my denial was driven home one evening in 1970, as my brother and I were returning from a stint picking fruit in Florida, and we stopped in at my parents' house in Kentucky. In his characteristically droll way, my father looked up from his newspaper and said, it's a good thing you're back tonight because you have to get on the bus in the morning to go into the army. Maybe you can imagine our stunned reaction. So we immediately put our heads together to come up with a plan of action. That night we found a local lawyer and we pulled him out of a dinner party to ask him about our options. On the lawyer's advice, we phoned the draft board and asked for three days grace to get our affairs in order. It still amazes me that they granted that. So, my brother and I departed our homeland in the middle of the night, one step ahead of the law. I held my breath as we crossed the border into Canada. I knew that the authorities had my name and that one wrong move could land us in prison for five years. But I made it safely into Canada, where I went to a Toronto organization called American Exiles, who advised me to cut my hair and get an offer of a job in Canada. To immigrate to Canada, I first had to go back into the U.S. and then return to the Canadian border. So I took the train from Toronto to Windsor alone, where I was put up in a safe house. It felt sort of like the Underground Railroad of slavery times. In the morning, I got a ride across the border into the U.S. from a young woman who was a volunteer for American Exiles. On the way across into Detroit, we agreed to say that we were old school friends. As we crossed into the U.S., once again, I held my breath. Once we were in the U.S., we turned around and approached the Canadian border where the Canadian official seemed unthreatening. Once inside the office, he asked me who was waiting for me in the car. An old friend, I answered. Yeah, we see her in here all the time, he said. So, immediately I knew right away that my cover was blown, but still I felt a sense of welcome. So once again, I had made it safely into Canada, and I never looked back. I became a Canadian citizen and have worked in a variety of jobs, including many years as a newspaper reporter and editor before coming to Selwyn House. I've met a lot of interesting people, including meet meeting future and former prime ministers right here in this room. Canada is like a small town that way. It's an amazing place, and I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. As a footnote, I would remind you that I went through most of these events with my brother Robert, which was an enormous help in dealing with it all, and also my parents were very supportive throughout. The only evidence of my legal status back home were the FBI agents who showed up at my parents' house once a year, asked some routine questions, and left. My only regret about this whole episode is the stress it brought on to my parents. In 1977, President Jimmy Carter pardoned all draft dodgers, and ever since, I've been free to travel to the U.S. like any other Canadian. I want to make two final points here. First, with all we may say about war resistance, we cannot forget the sacrifice of those who did not resist. Those who, like my cousin, went to war willingly and never returned. I don't know why they did that. After all, the North Vietnamese did not represent any threat to, to America. Maybe those people never realized that when the power brokers of this world order you to do something that you believe is morally wrong, you can say no. My second point is this. I feel a bit embarrassed to be talking to you today about something that happened half a century ago. I feel good about having been a part of the war resistance. I would like to think that maybe it saved a few lives. But for all that was accomplished in the 60s and the 70s, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the gay rights movement, I feel today that those were just a warm-up, the opening act, a dress rehearsal. 
What we face today with the climate crisis is much more immediate and far-reaching. It is a life or death moment for everyone, including you. We all created this problem together, and only by acting together can we solve it. I would like to conclude here by showing you a photo I took in July on Sherbrooke Street outside the gates of McGill University. The young woman in the center of the photo was my daughter, Laura, in her ridiculous flower costume. She, along with 25 of her companions, allowed themselves to be arrested as a protest against government inaction on climate change. You can see from the photo how the government responded to the presence of a few gentle protesters. Only weeks later, we had half a million people marching in the streets of Montreal, led by Greta Thunberg. From 25 to half a million in a matter of weeks. This is a movement that has obviously exploded. Like Jonah Rosen, who's sitting right here, I want to be a part of it, to change my life and raise my voice, not with the goal of liberating a minority of people, but to save all of humanity as well as most of our fellow species. So, once again, when the power brokers of this world order you to ignore the fact that they are doing something that you feel is morally wrong, you can say no.